Okay, we'll go ahead and get uh, started here this evening. Uh, first, if you turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. We'll look at uh, several passages tonight of Scripture. Uh, one verse here. <clears throat> The Bible says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you bless this evening and this lesson that we have. We pray that you would um, just apply this verse uh, to many areas of our life. I pray that you would help us to um, be willing to uh, learn and to take things that arise in this world that we're in and be willing to take the Bible and to lay them side by side and to accept what the Bible says about it and to hold fast to that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we certainly have lots of options in all realms, particularly here in America. There's options in churches. You literally can go find a church that will tell you whatever Whatever you want to hear, those churches are out there. You have a choice in that. You have a choice in clothing. I was reminded about this. Uh, Went to the hot spot of Walmart there on Tuesday night with my wife. And uh, just watching as uh, she was checking out, just looking at people. And I'm not going to surprise you when I tell you this, but uh, she was the only one in the entire store in a dress. You're going to fall over there when you hear that. Um, There's lots of options in clothing, um, and that, I wanted to just, I've heard it before, but I decided to go back Tuesday evening and just read a little bit about the history of uh, dress and pants on uh, women and things like that, and it was interesting, you probably have heard this before, but uh, really only the past 50 years or so that uh, uh, women uh, began and have dressed in pants and really... Fifty years ago, it was more very rare. Um, But I read I read some sources, both Christian and secular, and uh, they agreed on the source of that attire. And that is this, as the attitude of women toward authority, uh, including God, changed their attitude toward their clothing changed. And that's that's Christian and secular. Both agreed in that. And it's an attitude toward authority. And um, that thought hit me. When, uh, when someone leaves a church, particularly like our church, and uh, when they make an immediate wardrobe change, what they're doing for you is displaying their heart. It's a display of what's inside their heart. Um, <clears throat> putting uh, you on notice about what they believe. The clothes are... Language, And um, there's options in that today and options that uh, uh, are becoming more and more acceptable. But uh, just because something gains in popularity and gains in acceptance, it's no excuse for us to push the Bible aside and say, hey, well, it's because it's acceptable, it's popular, and it's done today because it works, then we're going to begin doing it. Uh, Our verse here in Thessalonians tells us otherwise. Prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Tonight's topic is not on those things, but rather on another realm in which there's many options and choices today and uh, which uh, many things have entered into that um, really don't stand up the test of uh, Bible scrutiny. And that's in the realm of medicine and healing, sometimes called alternative medicine. Um, I'm not a doctor, and I'm not going to pretend to go into everything and pretend to have a comprehensive treatment on this tonight, but I want to take some principles that I find uh, in this realm of what's called alternative medicine, and I want to take some principles that are clear in the Bible. I want to lay them side by side and uh, prove them, and uh, in the end, I want to hold fast to what's good. Uh, Use the Bible to, to do the proving, not what works or what someone says or, you know, this guy's doing it or, well, everybody's doing it now. Uh, We're going to really run ourselves into a rut if that's our attitude in life. 
Uh, we have to prove all things and hold fast to what's good. So with that in, uh, in mind, uh, in the time we have here, let me start by backing up a little bit and uh, <clears throat> explaining that there really are just two main sources of healing. If we consider the thought of healing, there's two main sources. The first source I'm going to call uh, is scientific or something that can be proven visibly and uh, can be proven scientifically. That's one source of healing. There's a second source of healing that is clear. It's seen in the Bible. It's also seen in the world today, and that is supernatural healing. So scientific, observable, provable methods of healing and supernatural healing, healing that comes from a supernatural source. First of all, what I mean by scientific healing is healing that has a logical explanation. There are proven scientific methods for healing, things that are done scientifically, things that are done and provable, such as vaccination shots, uh, stitches for cuts, uh, stents to open up uh, arteries, uh, techniques like chemotherapy and radiation. Uh, the Bible speaks of this type of uh, scientific healing when it mentions that Luke, uh, the author of two New Testament books, was a physician who traveled with Paul. And um, Paul is writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5, and he also mentions um, medicinal drink to cure uh, an ailment that Timothy had. Uh, these are physically provable methods based on research and natural laws. There's a, a subset to this scientific type of healing that's um, maybe not quite as proven. It's not necessarily a dangerous realm, but it's not quite as proven. Um, and, and that would be things such as med uh, vitamins. All right, some people... Uh, they're not going to go through their day without their stash of vitamins. Um, do they, are they always as effective as they're advertised to be? Well, it depends on who you ask. I had a, uh, my mom's, my mother's father, um, he was minimum, every day, minimum of 20 vitamins. And uh, I remember sitting in the room with him and uh, a commercial came on advertising Queen Bee Honey from... I forget, Iceland or something like that. Well, he ordered that right away. That was going to solve this uh, problem that he had. Um, he, he was a regular ingester of cod liver oil. I think that's supposed to cure everything. Um, they're still debating about whether vitamin C uh, really stops colds. Some people say no. Some people say yes. You remember whether your mom believed it or not. Because if she did, then you were chewing two or three every time it got below 40 degrees. And it was going to keep the cold away. Well, I, I did that. I got plenty of colds, too. So was it dangerous or you know, is there something spooky about taking vitamins? I don't think so. Um, but I don't know that they always do everything that they, they are advertised to do. Um, vitamin E for dry skin. Omega-3 fish oil for a healthy heart. Probiotics for digestion, glucosamine for joints. You know, who needs breakfast? <laughs> I mean, really, just uh, get, get, get a good drink that you like, and um, there you go. You'll be good for lunch. Vitamin A for good eyesight. And by the way, herbs, herbs solve everything. Okay, they're the remedy for everything. So as we said, uh, you know, you have your thing that you know works, and uh, some study is going to come out soon and going to tell you that it doesn't work. All right, they're not dangerous. They're not as proven as some other things. Um, so uh, if we poll this audience, we'd have as many different opinions on this as there are people here. Uh, another, uh, another thing that's uh, popular today as far as in the health uh, world is uh, following a sp specific diet. Uh, every week there's the new book out about the diet that this is the one. This, this is it. There's the, there's the hallelujah diet. There's the maker's diet. These are all books based on trying to, trying to take what people ate at different times during Bi the Bible days 
and to tell you that that's the way you should eat. Eat the way Jesus ate. Well, you know, Adam and Eve uh, were, were, were vegetarians. And then after that, the, uh, under the, the law, there were restrictions that were lifted in the New Testament. So w- there is no Bible diet. There's no diet that the Bible says this is what you should or, or should not eat. Some people say the Atkins diet's healthy. Some say it's going to kill you. All right. Um, some say caffeine is the antichrist. Um, uh, th- that's not real popular with others who call it their best friend and closest companion. And they, they don't start a day without Bible reading prayer and their coffee. Um, so uh, anyway, and again, there's nothing inherently dangerous in eating healthy or avoiding certain foods. Uh, as a young boy, I read Stonewall Jackson's biography, and I just remember this one thing, among the other things about him, this one thing stuck in my mind. He had some abdominal issues, and so his, his thing was to wrap himself in cold, wet sheets and suck on lemons. Now, if you'd ask him, you know, is that really helping you? I'm sure, yes, of course it is. Everybody ought to do it. You know, unscientific, I don't know, a little kooky, dangerous, I wouldn't say it's that dangerous. Um, Now, diet plans and vitamin supplements, we don't come to church to hear about that. Um, But I will say that even even that realm, that can actually be taken to an extreme, okay? That can be taken to an extreme and uh, and, and can uh, actually be dangerous. So I'll, I'll mention that right now. But in addition to this scientific type of healing, which there's things that are definitely proved, there are other things that are debatable um, that fall under this category. The second type of healing possibility I'll spend a little more time on tonight is supernatural healing. Okay? Healing by means of supernatural causes. Now, Determining these two different areas should be simple for us. Okay? Supernatural uh, events come from one of two different areas. Okay? God can perform supernatural things that we visibly see in this world, and so can uh, the prince of the power of the air of this world. Okay? Satan can perform supernatural uh, healings and miracles as well. Um, God, though, is in the uh, or has the ability to perform supernatural healing. Let's look at a couple of verses. Acts chapter three, verse twelve. Supernatural healing, one of two sources. First of all, God is a source of supernatural healing. James three twelve. Verse 11 gives us, the, gives us the account of a lame man that was healed. Verse 12 says, And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why, why marvel you at this, or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers. And then he goes on to give credit to God for being the one that performed uh, this healing. Let me read for you James 5.14. The Bible says, Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. So here's another verse that shows us that God has the power to heal people that are sick. We also see the Lord involved in this in 2 Corinthians 12.7. Paul gives us this account, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. For the sake of time, I'll just tell you that that thorn was not taken away. Okay? God, all-powerful God, chose not to take Paul's physical infirmity away. Paul ended up saying in verse 9, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Paul followed the Bible pattern to seek for healing. I can't help but believe he tried to get what I've called, and probably wrong, but what I've called scientific healing done. Luke was his partner. Luke was a physician. Luke would be with him. 
I, I can't help but think Luke tried medicines and things to heal Paul. It didn't work. Then Paul asked, followed the Bible pattern for supernatural healing, which James tells us is prayer, prayer of faith. That's the procedure for supernatural healing in the Bible. And God gave Paul an answer, and God said no. Now, Paul was traveling across the world. Any, he, was in the, he was in the biggest cities, the most well-known places in all the world. He was a traveler. He would have come across plenty of supernatural ways to get healing that did not include God in his life. I have no doubt about that. But he never walked down that route. When he went, did the Bible way, prayed and asked for healing, and God specifically told him no, that was the end for Paul. He took that answer as God's will for his life and did not try to short-circuit the Bible pattern for supernatural healing by getting involved in something else that I have no doubt he would have been familiar with through his travels. For him... Seeking supernatural healing apart from God would be to reject God and God's providence. So God is one source of supernatural healing. The other source of supernatural healing that is in existence in this world is the source of the prince of the power of the air. I started tonight saying that people today have options. And these options now, more than ever, include the realm of healing. Today, one of the healing options widely available was once only reserved for pagans, Hindus, and followers of Greek mythological religions. That was their realm. They were a part of that type of healing. Gradually, these techniques have worked their way into mainstream medicine and today are even being used by unwitting Christians. Supernatural miracles and healings that don't involve the God of the Bible have always existed on this earth. It's not like it's something new. It's not like it's uh, something that's just come about and now there's a new option. Oh, these supernatural healings that don't involve God have always been around. You remember in the Old Testament, kind of surprised me when I first read it. As a boy, the fact that the Egyptian magicians, when Aaron stood before them, they threw their, their rods down, and their rods became snakes too. Well, God didn't do that. Okay? That was supernatural, though. It did happen, and it was, uh, it was uh, observable. I recently uh, made a point to talk with Dave Olson and Dr. Patton, both who were here um, this last month, and they both, both of them reassured me that there are plenty of healings that go on in Suriname and in Zambia that is both supernatural and not sourced in God, the God of the Bible. They say there is plenty of that that's going on, supernatural healing. So this type of healing has nothing, nothing to do with the God of the Bible or with the name of Jesus Christ. So, my hope tonight is that you'll sincerely and spiritually examine the issue at hand. Our text, 1 Thessalonians 5.21, actually commands us to do that. There are two command words in that verse. Prove and hold fast. The word prove means to scrutinize whether a thing be genuine or not. To test through battle. To determine reliability and trustworthiness. Prove, and then it tells us what we're supposed to prove. All things. Don't be naive. Don't pretend like it's not a big deal. Prove all things. Scrutinize, test, and determine the reliability of. This prove, it's the present tense. It's a command. The idea is continually be proving. Why? Because... Thirty years ago, people would have wondered what in the world a lesson like this is about. But there's things that, that uh, uh, happened ten years ago that 
40 years ago weren't an issue. That's why we are to continually be proving all things. Because Satan never stops. Satan's new things, new attempts that are really just reworked old ideas are always going to come about. And there's going to be the deceived elect that fall for it. So our command from God is to continually be proving. Um, 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, prove your own selves. Philippians 1.10 says, approve things that are excellent. And Ephesians 5, 6 through 11 says, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. All three of those passages use this same word, prove, test, scrutinize. The second uh, word is hold fast. If you look at Acts 27.40, this is important, you'll see this word used again, Acts 27.40. But the word hold fast means to keep possession of. You could picture a running back running through a line, a defensive line, and into the linebackers holding the football. He's not holding that football uh, uh, lightly. He's not having a soft grip on that. When he runs through the line, he is holding on to that football with all of his strength. He's holding fast. In Acts 27.40, we see this word used. Um, and it's a nautical term, a term that people familiar with uh, the shipping world would be familiar with. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves into the sea and loosed the rudder bands and hoisted up the mainsail to the wind and made toward the shore. That word made toward is this word hold fast. So the picture is of the captain holding the wheel in the midst of this terrible storm, and he is aiming for a certain point, a particular goal, and he's heading that way. He is holding fast. He's making toward the shore. That's the, that's the seriousness with which we should hold fast to things that are good. This verse, our text, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, has with it a reverse side. If we're supposed to hold fast to the things that are good, then we need to also be very willing and ready to let go and push away the things that are bad. If we're holding what, what is good, we're not going to want to be able to, we shouldn't be able to hold fast what is bad. Satan is deceitful and transforms himself and his devices always into things that look good. He wants to deceive Christians. That's his goal. That's his technique is to deceive. So we have to prove, we have to hold fast, and then we have to push away what didn't stand up to the test of Scripture. Now, uh, let me just get a little more specific and explain that alternative medicine, much of alternative medicine, most is inseparably linked with what is called the New Age Movement. Okay? The New Age Movement, we hear about occasionally. Uh, heard about it a lot in the 70s and 80s. Uh, then it really came on the scene through the 90s and assimilated itself into all kinds of different realms gradually and slowly. Um, the um, New Age is a movement of spirituality, politics, health, education, and business that has as its purpose to direct the thinking and the actions of all of society. It is not a cult. It is a collection of cults. So says the book, The Kingdom of the Cults. In reality, the New Age movement is anything but new. It's rooted in the ancient mystery, mystery pagan religions of Egypt and Babylon. The terms it uses may be new, but its principles and practices are the same things that the churches of Jesus Christ have been standing and preaching against for over 1900 years. The same things. Reworked, renamed, and deceived Christians can easily fall prey to that. Which is why we have to take our job, our task of proving all things seriously. That's another reason why there's a very practical application to the local church. 
and the warnings and the preachings that come from it. The New Age movement boiled down is Hinduism in updated terms. Now, here are some of the terms that fit well in with New Age idealism. You've probably heard some of these. All these terms are good and acceptable and and, and used by those in the New Age. Pantheism, reincarnation, karma, evolution, unlimited human potential, energy healing, inner power, Near-death experiences, Kabbalah, auras, UFOs, higher consciousness, meditation, yoga, visualization, out-of-body experiences, metaphysical, holistic healing, therapeutic touch, biofeedback, hypnotherapy, paranormal. That's just the start. To go on for another 10 minutes reading New Age acceptable terms. Again, this movement is very subtle. A person could easily be be deceived by it. As a high schooler, there was a commercial that came on a lot about a book called Dianetics. Dianetics. Learn how to improve yourself. Learn how to get more done in less time. Dianetics. Uh, Sounded like a good book. I went and bought it for for my dad for Christmas. And he opened it up and said, well, thank you for this book. Well, the author is L. Ron Hubbard. Okay. I didn't know. I'd never heard about it. It sounded good. And I brought in the most popular New Age book of that era into our home. And my dad was gracious and explained, you know, what, what, what things were about. So I'm just saying it's, 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 it's easy to misunderstand the point and some of the issues behind the New Age movement. And it's particularly easy in this world of medicine into which it has grown in the past 18 years immensely. Here's a stat. In 1992, 2% of U.S. medical schools offered courses in alternative medicine. In 2004, 67% of U.S. medical schools offered courses in New Age medicine. Now, before I get into the actual issue of terms in alternative medicine to be aware of, Let me encourage you to study up on the New Age movement, and I'll give you one good reason why. Oprah Winfrey is the self-proclaimed priestess of the New Age movement. She does not try to hide that one bit. And maybe you remember the presidential candidate that she began supporting from the very first day that he proclaimed himself a candidate for political office. She gave big money to this man, campaigned with vigor uh, for him, and he was the guy that was elected as our next president. So keep that in mind um, as well. What I want to take is the last couple minutes here and briefly describe some of the medicinal or healing practices that the New Age Encyclopedia claims as its own. I'm not saying, hmm, I've searched this out and figured it out. This was easy. This is the New Age Encyclopedia claiming these types of healings and practices as their own. So this is from them. Let me repeat what I said earlier. Healing is either scientific or supernatural. All right, and it's not, and it is not to be explained naturally. Its source must be God or the forces of darkness in this present world. Let me give you a list. Stay with me here. Life force energy. This is the belief that there is an energy that permeates everything and flows around the body and affects a person's health. Life force energy. There are different aspects of alternative medicine that make use of this life force energy. They are things such as yoga, acupuncture, reflexology, and homeopathy. Visualization. This is the idea that your mind can heal you. Mind over matter. You visualize yourself as healed. You visualize it and your mind uh, can heal you. Hypnosis. Hypnosis is used for everything from pain relief to uh, weight control. 
maybe somebody, I may, maybe I just maybe make a little allowance there. And no, um, convicting there. Maybe Gautam Gupta uses that. You know, he has patience in four states. Um, the Encyclopedia of New Age Beliefs says that hypnosis is associated with magicians, witch doctors, and mediums. Many defend the use, use of hypnotherapy because, here's a quote from many of them, it works. And so they use it. Well, we could save the Olsons and the Patents a lot of medical bills, couldn't we? If we just said, you know what, why are you wasting your money coming over here for your healing? You already told us that you've, you, have, uh, you have seen with your own eyes successful healing methods um, from the witch doctors on their respective fields. It works. It's not acceptable. If you're a Christian and your reason is it works, that is sad. That's wrong. That's wrong. You've been fooled. Meditation, not speaking of biblical sense of thinking on God's word, but the New Age alternative medicine goal of meditation is to reach an altered state of consciousness, an altered state of consciousness. Other things, dream analysis, homeopathy. Homeopathy claims to provide not only physical healing, but also to transform and improve a person's emotional And physical condition. And now it sounds good. It sounds harmless enough. But it's something that's claimed along with all these other things to be uh, a realm in which New Age practitioners are operating. They claim that. Homeopathy was founded by Samuel Hinnemann, a man who rejected the Christ of the Bible. His uh, mentor, the person he chose to follow, was Confucius. His stated goal for homeopathy was to act on the vital life force that permeates all things and to restore balance within the body. Another thing, reflexology. This involves applying pressure to specific points of the body to stimulate the body's own healing powers. Usually this assumes that a hand or a foot, a part of it somehow corresponds with another part of the body. The man who invented reflexology said that there are ten zones in the body that can be manipulated by means of foot massage. Now, this is something listed in the New Age Encyclopedia of Alternative Medicine Practices. All right, now we can try to say, well, you know, I don't see a big deal with that. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. The Bible is our measure, okay, not... It works, or I don't see a big thing with it. Let's look at the Bible. Let's make it simple and use that to be the guide for our life. Save ourselves from getting dabbling in something that then pulls us down. There's another very unusual thing called iridology. This is examining the iris in the eye in order to make a diagnosis for health. Macrobiotics involves following mainly a vegetarian diet. Sometimes fish is included. But with this macrobiotic uh, vegetarian diet, they warn of several vegetables to stay away from because they have too much yang in them. The yin and the yang. The yin good, the yang bad. That's the Korean flag, by the way. You know, the little swirly flag. All right. That's not a Christian-based country. That's why that's one of their symbols. Okay. We have a slogan, in God we trust, yet we are now bringing in Hinduism and Eastern religions and letting it change our country. That's why those that know the foundations of our country and the b- biblical foundations are so disheartened at what's happening these days. How much worse is it when we allow that type of stuff into our churches? So this macrobiotic diet warns of more or less... Vegetables that to stay away from because they don't have very good karma. And um, this goes back to that old Hindu idea of dualism, the force of good versus the force of evil. Therapeutic touch. 
is also growing in popularity. This is the idea of the trans, you'll like this, the transfer of healing energy from the doctor's hands to the patient's body. It is the unruffling of the congested energy field. And it's done. And it, 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 and, and, and it is done in hospitals around here. Okay? You're like, well, yeah, that's great. Unruffling the congested energy field? Yes. 62%, I said it in 2004, of U.S. medical schools offered alternative medicine, as opposed to 2% in 1992. A couple more. Applied kinesiology is something that was invented in 1964, and it says that every illness is accompanied by a weakness in a corresponding muscle. And so they search for the corresponding muscle that is the avenue toward healing, applied kinesiology. Another realm to beware of, not going to just beware of places, realms of chiropractics. Okay? They have their place, undoubtedly, but they are a door. All right? Many people in the chiropractic realm are heavily involved in alternative medicine. Same thing with things like acupuncture. And other things. Let me uh, let me have you look here. Last of all, Luke chapter um, twelve, verse fifty-six. Luke twelve fifty-six. I'll close here. Luke twelve fifty-six. Jesus Jesus here gives a stern warning, <clears throat> talking to his listeners, and he tells them this: Ye hypocrites. Ye can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that ye do not discern this time? Jesus said that, and his purpose was to rile up his listeners, to get them mad. Yeah, he says you can, you can discern the sky, you, you can talk about the weather and recognize what's going to come the next day, but you're not wise, you're not observant enough, discerning enough to recognize the time that we're living in. That makes some people mad. How can we, how can we be so sharp, maybe with our money or with different realms that we're a part of, and we're sharp with those things and real discerning. We know our realms well, but if we're not careful, we can be in this time and all these non-biblical things can become a part of us and we can just accept them without proving them. And we miss out, can't even discern the time. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 lays a duty at our feet. It's to prove all things, to reject the bad, and hold to the good. When you do this, you might find that you yourself have been manipulated or deceived. Maybe completely ignorantly. If that's the case, let's do what 1 Corinthians 5.21 says to do. Let go of that and hold on to what we know is good. We know the Bible is good. We know Bible truth is good. We know supernatural healing from God, which... The pattern for that is the prayer of faith. That's good. Hold on to that. In reality, this lesson tonight isn't really primarily about alternative medicine or even about the new age. Okay? It's really just about being discerning Christians. And discerning Christians need to be discerning continually. Continually prove all things. And continually hold fast to that which is good. And continually be ready to let go and push aside those things that do not stand the test.